Alright, thanks for watching and today I want to talk to you about a really cool theorem in analysis called the Riemann-Lebesgue lemma. And you're like, whoa, two important mathematicians, it's gotta be a very important theorem. Well, sort of. I don't think it's important, but um, the proof is very classical and it's a perfect example of a Lebesgue integral argument. So let me first state this. The theorem says, if you take a function, so f of x, so if, if you have a function f in L1 of r, and L1 just means the integral of absolute value of x, dx, over the real numbers, it's finite, so the function has finite integral. Then, if you're considering the following, take f of x and multiply it by this weird, uh, very periodic thing, e minus i z x dx. So you take the function f and you multiply it by this function e i z x, which just whirls around the circle many, many times. And some people recognize this thing as the Fourier coefficients, and that's correct. In fact, once we integrated this with respect to x, it just becomes a function of z, and some people know this as the Fourier transform. So if you consider the Fourier transform, which is the integral of f of x e to the minus i z x, and you integrate this with respect to x, then it becomes a function of z, and the question is, what happens as z goes to infinity? Well, the Riemann-Lebesgue lemma says that this in fact goes to zero. So it goes to zero as z goes to infinity, but also minus infinity, and in general, z could be any complex number, so if z, you know, gets infinite modulus, then this goes to zero. And yeah, kind of weird thing, but it kind of illustrates how nice integrable functions are. So this Fourier uh, transform sort of measures how squiggly or oscillatory the function is. And we're claiming that if a function is integrable, then the oscillations is sort of go to zero, so, which is a nice thing. And in particular, if the oscillations don't go to zero, the function is so wild, wild that it's not integrable. Okay, and lastly, it also explains why when you calculate Fourier, uh, Fourier series, for example, you find that the coefficients look somehow like this. Always something over n or something over n squared, and as m goes to infinity, this goes to zero. This is sort of the analog of this. It's a continuous analog. And as I said, it's not the statement of the theorem that's important. It's actually the proof of it because it's a very classical argument. So let me prove this now. And it also explains why, you know, how in, uh, for the Lebesgue integral, you define it by steps. So first of all, let's assume the function is very easy. Namely, it's just the indicator function of an interval. So step one, suppose, so f is the indicator function of some interval a, b, which means f looks like this. On the interval a, b, it's one, else it's zero. Pretty, you know, simple thing, but it's not what a simple function is. Simple function comes later. Then let's calculate the Fourier transform. F hat of z then becomes the integral from minus infinity to infinity of the indicator function of a, b of x, e minus i, z, x, dx. Great, but since this function is 1 on AB and 0 everywhere else, 
we're actually just integrating from a b so integral from a b of 1 e to the minus i z x x and this is nice you can find an antiderivative so e to the minus i z x over minus i z from a to b Okay, and again, z goes to infinity, so you can assume it's non-zero, so it's okay to divide by it. And then we're left with e, so I guess we have the minus, so minus e to the uh, minus i z b plus e to the minus i z a over minus i z. Let's show that this goes to zero, and to show that it goes to zero, to show it goes to zero, let's consider the modulus. So the absolute value of this, so e minus i, z b plus e to the minus i, z a over minus i z. Uh, just a little small correction. So z is not complex. Let's assume z is real. Then, this is nice. The absolute value of both of those things are 1. So this is less or equal to e to the minus i z b plus e to the minus i z a over absolute value of z. And this, again, this has absolute value 1. This has absolute value 1. So you get 2 over absolute value of z, and that goes to 0 as the absolute value of z goes to infinity. Okay, so now we have shown this result to be true. If f is an indicator function of an interval, so if f is an indicator function of a, b, the result is true. And now the second step is to do stuff a little bit more complex than that. Namely, we want to take indicator functions of those intervals. So now let f be, let's say, the sum from n, I guess from 1 to some fixed number, n from 1 to m of cn, indicator function of some interval. So a n is a n b n. But then the nice thing is the Fourier transform is linear, so f hat of z becomes the sum from 1 to, inf from 1 to n of cn, indicator function of a n hat of z. But, and by the way, this is what's called simple functions. That's why I didn't say before simple functions. But... By what we've shown, so by step one, this thing goes to zero as absolute value of z goes to infinity. So this whole thing goes to zero as the absolute value of z goes to infinity. And so our result is also true for simple, fu for simple functions. And now, as I said, we want to build up to our general Lebesgue integral functions. But the nice thing is, remember how the Lebesgue integral was defined? You start with those simple functions, and then you just approximate any function by those simple functions. And in fact, there is a density result here. So I guess step three. Let's do our epsilon delta argument now. So that epsilon goes to zero. Then, since f is in L1, and the simple functions from step two, so in simple functions, are dense in L1, L1, 
like it's a classical uh, Lebesgue integral result, but I think it just follows from the definition of the Lebesgue integral. Okay, so simple functions are dense. What does that mean? It means that if you have your function f, then no matter how close, you can always find a simple function g that's as close as you want. So since simple functions are dense in L1, so then, so there exists G, simple, such that G is epsilon over 2 close to F. So this little segment is epsilon over 2. So... So I guess, I guess f minus g in L1 is less than epsilon over 2. And what this really means is that integral from minus infinity to infinity of f of x minus g of x dx is less than epsilon over 2. So it's kind of an integral distance. For every point x, you measure the distance between f and g, and you integrate that. Okay, and that's very good, because now, if f, again, is a given function approximated by some simple function, but remember, our result was true for simple functions. So, maybe step four. By step two, so the result for simple functions applied to G, we know that G hat of Z goes to zero as Z goes to infinity, which means in particular we can make Z you know, there is some threshold z such that this becomes less than epsilon over 2. Meaning, there exists, I guess let's say capital M, such that mixing up lots of things, such, such that if Z is greater than capital M, then this thing is less than epsilon over 2. But this is not quite what we want. We want the result for F hat. And now again, we want to show z goes to infinity. Basically, f hat is less than epsilon. So with that m, so with the same m, let's now use a triangle inequality. With the same m, if z is greater than m, then Let's see, f hat of z. Ideally, we want this to be less than epsilon, but now, remember that is f hat of z minus g of z, sorry, g hat of z plus g hat of z, okay, just by this cancellation, and then that's less than or equal now by the triangle inequality to f hat of z minus g hat of z plus g hat of z. Let's now see what the first part becomes. Now by definition, what is f hat again? Well, that becomes integral from minus infinity to infinity of f of x e to the minus e i uh, z x minus g hat is g of x e to the minus i zx dx. 
And this, remember, we said because g was simple and we proved the result for simple functions, this is epsilon over 2. Right. And now, apply the triangle inequality again. So, that's less than or equal to integral from minus infinity to infinity of. Like, factor out at e minus i z x and then f of x minus g of x dx, then plus epsilon over 2. This again, because, sorry, again, z is real, this has modulus 1. And so we are left with, I guess, equals to minus infinity to infinity of f of x minus g of x dx plus epsilon over 2. And what is this? This is none other than the L1 distance between f and g plus epsilon over 2. But remember what we said, because you know simple functions are dense in L1, this was less than epsilon over 2. So we're left with less than epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2, and we have a satisfying epsilon at the end. So we are done, and we can go home very happy. Woo. And we've proven this important riemann lebesgue lemma. And, um, and as I said, this is a very classical analysis argument, where you first prove it with very easy functions, and then just build yourself up using this little density argument. All right, so if you like this and want to see more analysis video, please make sure to subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much.